workshop. Um, the subject is preventing evictions into homelessness. And uh, we've got three uh, excellent speakers uh, for you. Um, I'm David Bogle. I'm Chief Executive of High Town Housing Association, but I have an alter ego which, as chair of the Homes for Cathy group um, of housing associations. Um, hopefully you're all members of Homes for Cathy, but if your association is not, then I'll give you a quick uh, advert. We're um, a group of around 100 housing associations and housing charities um, aiming to uh, raise the profile of what housing associations are doing to uh, end homelessness to support homeless people, um, but also to encourage housing associations to try to do more uh, because um, obviously housing associations have resources. And I suppose we're trying to link back to the Cathy Come Home um, drama documentary, um, Ken Loach, that was uh, on TV over 50 years ago because it's a time when also a lot of housing associations were formed in response to that, um, that program up and down the country, um, in different countries as well, uh, Wales and Scotland. And um, a lot of housing associations around now have, have got that historic um, uh, link. And, and I guess, you know, in Hopes of Cathy, we think that um, Homelessness is a link to this enduring purpose of, of housing associations to house people who, who uh, are homeless or can't afford to buy or rent on the open market. Um, and it's important to, to focus on that social impact and social value. Um, we've got a set of nine commitments, which hopefully you've seen. Um, and actually this workshop is very much focused on the, the, the fourth of those nine commitments. The commitments cover uh, a number of aspirations that we're hoping that housing associations who are members can, and, and housing charities can sign up to, um, including having flexible allocation policies, um, uh, trying to provide to, to, to ensure that lettings to homeless people are sustainable, trying to do something about migrant homeless people as well. So a, a range of, of, of commitments. Uh, but number four is about trying to prevent evictions wherever we can, where someone is engaging with us. So that's what the subject of, of this uh, particular workshop is uh, about. And um, as I say, we've got three speakers. We've got Jenny Bibbings from Shelter Kumru, who's got to talk about the research that uh, they've done into uh, uh, preventing evictions. We've got Sue Dickinson from Wales and West Housing Association, the Business Improvement uh, facilitator they're talking about how Wales and West have reduced evictions dramatically in their stock and also Simon Young from uh, South Yorkshire Housing Association who have also been doing some great work on on reducing evictions and I was looking at their stats yesterday uh, in a seminar that that um, uh, Charlotte of, of South Yorkshire and I did at the National Housing uh, Federation's Housing Summit. Um, so um, I'll get. We'll, we've got questions at the end. If anyone would like to raise them then, or perhaps put them in the chat box, that would be useful. Or the the question um, panel. Uh, if you could keep muted, that would be that would be helpful until we get to the question time. So um, if I could go straight into to Jenny Bibbings from Shelter Kumru, please. Thank you, David, and um, good morning, everyone. Border da. Um, so my name is Jenny, um, head of campaigns at Shelter Cymru, um, and I'm going to be talking to you about this the brand new piece of work which we published last week. Um, I wanted to see if I can share my screen now. Oh, I think uh, I need my uh, my screen sharing to be enabled. While we're waiting for that, I'll just um, give you some some background about this this piece of work and how it came about. So, the the goal of ending evictions into homelessness from social housing is uh, is something that we at Shelter Cymru have been uh, working on for a number of years now, and it's really been adopted by the sector as a whole in Wales. And this is um, this has got a lot to do with our former director, John Pusey, who's retired now, 
but John, um, he persuaded the current housing minister, Julie James MS, to adopt this goal of eliminating evictions into homelessness from social housing. So over the last few years in Wales, as I'm sure you, you, you probably picked up, there's been a huge amount of activity and progress in this un, under this broad umbrella. And we've really seen the, the impact of that in our casework at Shelter Cymru because um, our casework, of course, is, is a, a barometer of when things go wrong in housing in general. And, and that was really, that was the reason why we started talking about ending evictions into homelessness because we were conscious of the impact that eviction into homelessness was having on people who were using our services, the human impact, the impact of you know, other services. We witnessed how hard it was to get out of homelessness once people were in it. So um, we did a piece of work and that showed that more than three quarters of the, of the, the cohort of social tenants who were evicted were still homeless six months post eviction. So we were really conscious about, about drawing attention to this. And, and, and the change in our casework in recent years speaks for itself, really. And some of the names that we used to be very familiar with working with, some of the landlords who used to bring us quite a lot of casework now don't feature in our casework anymore, which for me is that's exactly what our campaigning should be doing. It should be about reducing demand on our service at the end of the day. So it's been really positive. We've also seen the impact on the uh, the possession stats as a whole in Wales. So um, so before we went into lockdown in uh, March 2019, Welsh social landlords had achieved a 40% reduction in possession claims over the space of a year. And well, you know, it's it's huge progress to make. Um, as a sector over the course of a single year and, and we know that what's gone behind that is a huge amount of culture change and and a lot of innovative practice and I think more than anything else it's it's a it's compassionate practice isn't it so I think from our perspective we've got a great sense of possibility about about where this agenda will take us next and, and about what's possible in terms of, of preventing homelessness from social housing. So that's really what this report is aiming to do. It's our contribution to that discussion about where we go next and how do you get from, uh, from, from low evictions into homelessness to zero evictions into homelessness. And if I can share my slides, then I can, um, I can tell you a bit more. I, I'm still disabled. Jenny, on train. Can you, not, you, you can't share them. Oh, um, no. what, what I can do is I can try and share my, my slides. It, it, I, you should okay. be enabled, but I don't know why you're not. Um, so I'm going to share share them for you. Can everyone see that? Um, yes, there we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, you might just have to tell me to where to move them on. Okay, thank you, Vicky. Um, <laughs> if we just go to the background slide, please. Sorry, now my now my uh, computer's being slow. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Well done. <laughs> Um, so just a, a quick bit about methodology. So this was a report we did. We did some of the standard things that you would expect. So we did a desk based review and we, and we interviewed a load of stakeholders. We also did some research with tenants. And for this, we we took a, for us a bit of a different approach here. So we are normally what we would do is we would do retrospective research. So we would talk to tenants who've been evicted and we would find out about what the impacts were and, and do that kind of counterfactual work about well what could have been done differently and it's a little bit dissatisfactory that kind of approach because you've always got the benefit of hindsight haven't you so with this project instead we actually got to know tenants who whose tenancies are under threat right now because of serious rent arrears so we worked with our two partner housing associations, that's Wales and West and Cloyd Allen Housing Association, and they shared details of, of 16 tenants with us. And our researcher, Sarah, is also a caseworker. So she was using her casework skills to communicate with people, find out about their situation, actually put some plans in place to, to prevent homelessness occurring. And but she was using the research side of, of her role to, to reflect and analyze and, and produce insights which have fed into the report. So it was a, a really interesting approach for, for us. In terms of our success, 
um, with, with engaging tenants. We, we had partial success. So out of the 16 tenants, there were six who we meaningfully engaged with and were able to put plans in place to save their tenancies. Um, and as I say, lots of insight, which is fed into the report itself. There's a huge amount of information in this report, and I'm going to just barely skim the surface, to be honest, in this 20 minutes. So I would very much recommend that you have a look. It's on the Shelter Cymru website. Um, really, what we were doing was responding to what landlords were telling us they wanted at this stage, which was a whole load of ideas and things that you could put in motion and start in, in, you know, experimenting with right now. So, so that's what we've done with this report. It's full of practical examples and there's much more than I can possibly do justice to in a, in a 20 minute presentation. So please do have a look at that. The, um, the good practice examples that we've gathered have been organized into these broad six principles, which I'll talk you through in just a moment. And then the whole thing has been brought together and synthesized into a tentative model for what a, a system that ends evictions into homelessness might look like in practice. And I'll be showing you some, some slides about that, or Vicky will, in, uh, in, in a short while. So um, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so a quick run through the six principles. This first one is, I'm sure, um, you know, it would make total sense to you. Some of this is probably um, quite obvious to, you know, especially if you're members of, of the Homes for Cathy group, because you will already be thinking in these ways. Nevertheless, we've brought all the learning together in this one place. And so principle one is about culture. So we were told very consistently how important this is and about how you have to, as a senior team, as a board, you have to embody these values. And if you do that, if you show and demonstrate how important you believe it is to, to have that person-centered approach and to seek to avoid evictions, then that is going to percolate through your organization and it's going to affect the mindset and actions of all of your, all of your people. It's the most fundamental step really is to have that focus on culture. We've highlighted Cloyd Allen Housing Association as an example here because they have consciously gone through this process um, over the last few years so that they wanted to change their internal culture. They uh, developed this mission statement together to beat poverty and they have consciously worked on this through the organization with a, a stated aim that they want to eliminate evictions into homelessness. And this has led to all sorts of, of like practical initiatives coming out. So for example, they've done a, um, a social enterprise to address food poverty. They're giving out grants to address financial hardship, um, all sorts of practical things like that. And last year, they, um, they didn't evict anyone into homelessness. They did carry out four evictions, none of which were into homelessness. So it's, a, it's an interesting example to focus on. Uh, next slide, please. Principle two is all about getting things right from the outset. And to, to stress that this is with a rapidly housing ethos. So um, if you put in an email address, I think someone's got If you wouldn't mind muting, that would be very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um, Lots of people talked about pre-tenancy support and getting the allocation right, but it's really important to think about this with a rapid rehousing ethos. So we're not talking about waiting till people are tenancy ready. We're talking about making sure that people are tenancy supported and that they have what they need to, to, to get the foundation strong for a successful tenancy. We were quite, quite struck by how rare it is in Wales anyway for um, uh, furnished tenancies to be offered. It's, it's actually it's vanishingly rare in Wales. Um, and it's also very standard practice to rip out all the floor coverings and to give people this kind of bare shell and say, there you go, there's your home, good luck. So really we were interested in, in finding examples of where um, housing associations had gone that extra mile to, to get um, people set up in a strong way. And, I, and I, we've got South Yorkshire here, I shall let Simon um, talk to you in more detail about, about how they've achieved that, but it's a really, we thought it was a really good model because there's uh, it, the emphasis is on the, the tenancy from the outset, but you can see the impact in terms of the eviction prevention figures as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is all about relationships. 
it's about getting a relationship of trust with your tenants and, and communicating well with people. We were really struck by when we did our research with tenants to understand where their rent arrears sat in their mindset alongside all the other issues that some people were having to deal with. And really some people just, it, they couldn't focus on it because they were dealing with such a lot of other um, issues in their lives. So this is why we, we're emphasizing being, being trauma informed and understanding actually how that life trauma reduces people's capacity to be able to focus on pressing issues such as, such as rent arrears. Um, there's a lot in the report about communicating with tenants in a, you know, in, a, in a clear way and letting them know about the gravity of their situation, but without issuing notices seeking possession as a way of encouraging people to engage. Because as we know, for every tenant who thinks that they better address their issue because they've had a loss, there's another tenant who can't face it and puts it to one side and actually disengages further. So there's lots of insight in the report around that. There was one um, one story from one of the tenants who we spoke to who was um, she had about three thousand pounds worth of arrears and she'd had a notice seeking possession but she didn't know what it meant right so when we talked to her she was really positive about her her landlord she, they've been so supportive and not you know nice and everything and she had nothing but good things to say about her landlord she didn't realize that the notice seeking possession meant that she might lose her home you just didn't understand the gravity of it at all. So our caseworker luckily was able to, to work with her. Uh, but that just shows an example of, um, of how communication is so easy for, for, mis for messages to be, to be misunderstood. Um, next slide, please. Partnership working. Um, this can be a challenging one for landlords. Um, it can be difficult to get the right people around the table, uh, mental health services, social services, etc. Nevertheless, the evidence suggests that it's a promising area for, um, for getting a coordinated response and preventing homelessness and sustaining tendencies is, is developing these multi-agency relationships. There's a couple of examples here, Monmouthshire and Torvine Housing Association. Um, uh, Monmouthshire is the council and Torvine is Bronavon Housing Association together with the council. Both of them are developing multi-agency panels. There's an example in England as well in Sedgemoor Council as well. And these, see, if you can get, if you can get the right people around the table, they can be a very effective way of coordinating um, interventions and making sure that the right services are getting to the people at the right time. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's, it's, it's a challenge making that work. And one of the things we're, we're pointing out is that the Welsh Government, for example, could help this by, um, by increasing the, the priority that homelessness has to non-housing um, agencies and a, a shared public sector homelessness prevention duty, for example, would be one way of, of helping that along. Uh, next slide, please. So principle five, it's all about, and this sounds so obvious, <laughs> but it's about making the most of what you've got available in your local area. And I, I, it seems obvious, I know, but, but we were struck in the research by, number one, there were a lot, some of the tenants who we worked with had unmet support needs, yeah, that their landlords, had, despite being really good landlords, had not picked up on. The, the stakeholder um, interviews as well showed there were a number of stakeholders who actually admitted that they, they weren't as aware as they could be about what's available in the local area. And so staying on top and understanding where you can refer people is really important. There is a, a question mark here as well about making sure that the right services are available in your local area. So one intervention which has come out very strongly as having a good evidence base and being extremely effective at keeping people in their homes is um, antisocial behavior, holistic intensive support services. There's an example cited here, which is from Pobble, um, but there's a number of, there's a, a couple of other examples in Wales and we were really struck by the fact that some of these services have been going for 10 years plus and they're getting 100% success rates, right? 100% engagement, 100% ASB elimination, 100% tenancies saved. 
it's really good and yet only a handful of these services are available in Wales so so we've put this in our model and, and are suggesting that you know if you have one of these in your area fantastic use it if you don't then perhaps you should be talking to your partners and seeing what can be done because the evidence base is so strong that that it works as uh, at eliminating antisocial behavior uh, next slide please the final principle is about perseverance and and really this loops back to the start about culture it's about having that attitude of not giving up on people and understanding that people's lives ebb and flow and their ability to work with you is going to ebb and flow so having that that attitude of, of persevering is um, we think it's it's really important and in the report there are um, as I say there's a whole load of thing of, of um, alternatives to a NOSP that you might want to consider. Some of it has been tried, some of it hasn't been tried. Um, it's all about ways of, of, um, of working with your tenants and sticking with your tenants. The possibility of a managed move was something that we looked into as well. There's some evidence of this being carried out and, um, and we've got some uh, some examples in the report. What we mean by managed move is essentially a transfer to accommodation which would suit that household better. Uh, perhaps in your own stock or maybe if you have a partnership agreement with another partner housing association. So there's a few examples in Wales now where um, housing associations are talking to each other and putting some of these um, arrangements in place so that you could transfer someone to, to uh, accommodation that better suits their needs and gives them a fresh start. Maybe they can afford it better. So it, it, it's an option. So those are the six principles. I'm going to talk you through the, the, the model now. Um, just to warn you, before you see the slide, there's a lot of text. <laughs> um, I was hoping to kind of zoom in a bit, but, but we'll see what it's like on the screen. And um, there's an awful lot of information to fit into these, uh, into these models, as I'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate. So if you can give us the next slide, there we go. Right, so this is, this is stage one of the model, okay? There are actually three models, sequ broadly sequential models. The reason why there are three is because we kind of recognized, oh, we've gone backwards, there we are. We, we had to build in the fact that different providers are at very sta different stages of the journey here. Um, so we had to, to factor in that, that process. And so we did three models so that providers could look at this and see where you are on the journey, if you like. Uh, the other reason why we did three is because um, because there are gaps which need to be filled in. It, it's not a complete blueprint. Some of this stuff landlords can't do on their own, right? You need to have a favourable environment from the government. You need to have a favourable funding environment. You need to have benefit levels that, that are favourable and so on and so forth. So, so what we've done with these models is we've, we've highlighted where those external enablers need to to be in place. And that's particularly um, uh, prevalent in the, the intermediate model. We've also highlighted where there needs to be more evidence. And this is, as I say, you know, this hasn't really been done before. It's, it's, some landlords are kind of doing it now or they've done it last year, but it's so new. And, so, and some of this needs to be tried and tested further. So we, we've tried to be as upfront about that as possible. Um, as you can see, we, we built it along the, the typology of homelessness prevention because it's quite a useful way of thinking about where your interventions sit. And as a general, um, a general principle with these models is we are seeking to upstream our preventions. Yeah, so, um, so in this initial model, emergency is fuzzed out. That's because we're, we're seeking to avoid emergency interventions at this stage. Um, and by the time we get to the final model, you'll see that that's been upstreamed even further with crisis being fuzzed out as well. So everything is, is, is happening in a controlled way, um, avoiding emergency situations. And I guess the, the only other point to make here is we said it's tentative and it will change. Um, what we're hoping now is that we'll, we'll take some of this work and we will work with, with providers in a local or regional level. And when this is applied in a practical um, uh, level, it will change. And we're, we're quite comfortable with that. I just want to very quickly point out a few, um, a few points. I hope you can, I can just about read that. So I hope, um, I hope people can, can read it as well. 
very quickly, um, the universal box on the right um, summarizes a lot of the insights and the, and the examples from the report, which I've, I've talked you through. Lots of evidence base, um, good evidence about, about establishing, <clears throat> excuse me, tendencies in a, in a strong way. If you go to the left and look at the targeted box, under targeted, um, this is where some of the, the insights that we had from working with tenants come through, uh, where we talk about alternatives to a NOSP, where we talk about, as well about, about intensive support services such as the ASB um, support service that I mentioned, okay? At this stage, we're not looking to issue formal proceedings. We're seeking to communicate with tenants about the gravity of their situation, definitely, but we're not starting a process going that you might end up having to follow through at a later stage. Um, going across to the other side, um, for cr under crisis, there are two options open to you here, okay? So this is really at the point at which the landlord feels that the tenancy can't be sustained. I mean, that's obviously that's a judgment, isn't it? And it's not up to the landlord ultimately, it's not up to the tenant either, it's up to the courts, isn't it? But for argument's sake, this is where the landlord feels that the tenancy isn't working out. So what do you do with that stage, okay? You've got two options open to you. Uh, the first is this idea of a managed move or a transfer. We're suggesting at this stage that, that this should be done with tenant consent and um, that you should try and, and seek to avoid formal proceedings. If you're doing a managed move to also be, be going through an eviction process, it's, it's gonna force the tenant's hand. They might feel pressured to accept something that might not be right for them. So it's, it's, a, it's an alternative to formal possession proceedings, okay. The other option, of course, is to start formal proceedings. And if you do that, we've got a number of um, suggested mitigations here that you might like to consider so that you can assure yourself that the eviction isn't going to result in homelessness, okay? A number of different suggestions here. One of them, which completely needs testing and evaluation, um, it's a suggestion that you might like to develop a, a plan, a person-centered plan so that um, you can look at the person's situation and say, right, what can I do in terms of forbearance that will ensure that they can move out of this, this tenancy in a controlled way into a new tenancy somewhere, okay? So for example, you might uh, undertake not to execute the warrant until that suitable alternative accommodation is available, potentially. It's not gonna be suitable in every case. That's why we're, we're saying that it has to be person-centered. I'm very conscious of time. If we can just go to the next slide, which is the, the intermediate model. I won't go through all of this in detail. It's a more uh, established version of the first model. So your structures are more formalized. There's more of, a, of an emphasis on rapid rehousing here. And there's more of an emphasis on that multi-agency panel approach as well. Recognizing that it's not easy to bring people around the table, but getting those structures in place is gonna help. To, um, to give you the best shot of sustaining tenancies. And then if we quickly go to the final slide, uh, the final model is, um, it's the vision, it's the destination. And it's, it's not about achieving this overnight, absolutely not. But it's about uh, making sure that we understand what we're working towards. And what we're work working towards here is an early prevention model. And over time, we hope that landlords would seek to reduce their use of formal possession to zero. Because if you've got a, a fully mature preventative framework, which is supported by government, then arguably you should be able to, to manage things without formal possession. And for us in Wales, at least, we're, we're putting this out there as a, I guess, a kind of a, a reminder of where we might head in future, because we've had um, successive housing ministers have been really interested in this agenda and, and maximizing the homelessness prevention powers that, that housing associations have. And it, it might be that in future we'd end up with a, a legislative framework that perhaps you couldn't evict if homelessness was going to be the outcome. So, so we put this here to kind of get people to remember what we're aiming for and think of the future and potentially get ahead of any legislative change in the future. Uh, so there we are. That's a, a whistle-stop tour of, of our piece of work. Um, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, it's got my, con oh, uh, my contact details on it and uh, very happy to pick up, well, to, to hear your thoughts on this work, but also to pick up any conversations after today as well would be uh, very welcome. Thank you for listening. Diolch and Bauer.
there we go. Thank, thanks, Jenny. That was fantastic. I thought that was really well presented and, and hugely practical and useful for housing associations and landlords. Um, I love the principles and I like the, the diagrams. It's really um, uh, very helpful indeed, that model, I think. And uh, we'll certainly be looking at it in, in Hightown, I know that. And, and I'm sure uh, all the other homes of Cathy a housing association will find it useful. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, Jenny. We'll, we'll, if, if we could come back to questions for Jenny later on, and, and but keep going with the speakers for the time being. Um, um, yeah, I've just, um, I think we might have a problem with the sharing. Um, although it was enabled, I think um, perhaps it wasn't enabled when the meeting was created, which is why um, we, which is why Jenny couldn't share. I don't know, can, um, can Sue, can you see a share, a, a slide share button for yourself? If not, I can, um, I can try and uh, share it for you like I did with Jenny. No, it's disabled. Uh, okay, let me, um, hold on one second. Um, I'll just introduce, so Sue Dickinson uh, of Wales and West Housing Association Business Improvement Facilitator is our next speaker who's going to talk about how Wales and West have managed to drastically reduce evictions uh, with a person-centred approach which includes using outcome star. Uh, do you want to start off uh, Sue and we'll try and catch up with your presentation? That's lovely. Thank yeah. you, David. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, just a little bit of an introduction. I'm going to just give you a whistle stop tour of some of the journey that we've undertaken over the last few years. As you know, Jenny said, culture is absolutely utmost that we change our culture. And we, we've been going through that cultural shift um, it hasn't been easy. We're not all there. We, we are learning every day, all the time. Um, so it's just to share some of the learns that we've got. Jenny's already referred to a lot of them, um, but hopefully, you know, if you've got any questions, just ask me at the end. Okay, so are we okay with the slides? Okay, so we'll go on to the second slide, please, Vicky. Amazing. Okay, just so just a little bit about us. Um, we have 12,500 homes covering 15 local authorities, um, and we uh, provide services to around 20,000 residents. Over the years, evictions have radically reduced with Big us. Um, and the shift in culture has truly helped with this. Um, we are on a journey, as I've said, um, and the culture change hasn't suited everybody. We've moved very much from traditional to person-centered. And moving away from that traditional landlord to that of a person-centered um, approach, we wanna help you keep your home, has truly meant different approaches. And, uh, I won't tell any fibs, uh, it hasn't been that easy. Um, just, just doing practical things like being able to talk to somebody in a different way rather than, you know, sort of being guided by procedures and everything um, has taken practice. Uh, but our key focus is to look after um, our homes well and to help residents live in their homes and sustain their tenancies, if that's what they want to do, because not everybody wants to stay where they, they are at the moment. So next slide, please, Vicky. Okay, thank you. So Wales and West um, is a systems thinking organisation and systems thinking underpins everything we do. Systems thinking is where we look at things from uh, a customer or resident perspective. So we look at our systems looking from the customer eyes. Um, over the years, we've looked at many of our systems. We've looked at repairs, antisocial behavior, the rent system, um, and loads more. And um, by doing that, by being able to have a look at our, our systems, we've been able to uh, know understand and improve. Um, when we look at things from the customer perspective, 
um, and we know what's hitting our system, that helps us cement a purpose and what matters. You know, the purpose, what are we here to do? Uh, what matters to residents? And in doing so, we're able to then cement some measures that we can measure against. So these are our three operating principles, know, understand and improve. And before we can improve any of our systems, we have to know what's hitting our system. We need to understand the what and the why things are happening the way they do. And um, in doing so, we get to know what, what, what demand is hitting our systems. You know, what's happening with my repair? You sent me a rent statement. I don't understand it. Uh, I phoned yesterday. Nobody's got back to me. So finding out what the current system looks like and understanding the consequence of the current design uh, from the customer perspective, it can be a little bit painful because nobody likes to know their baby's ugly or be told that their baby's ugly. Um, so, so it really can be quite painful when we're actually looking at our systems and pulling it apart a little bit. Um, it challenges the thinking that created the system uh, and, and the assumptions as well. But this isn't about people or about performance, because we know that people come to work and want to do a good job. It's often the system design that needs to change. So the next slide is going to show you, uh, and I've used the rent system here, um, just to show you a bit of an example of what we found when we pulled um, a rent journey um, apart. So if we could have the next slide, please. That's lovely. Okay, so, so what we used to do in old worlds was we used to get a demand. So this is, um, I, I'm going to have housing benefit. This is a new applicant that, that signed up for a tenancy. And in old worlds, we used to step by step on big flip chart paper and we used to put it all again around the room. Um, I was constantly in trouble for leaving blue tap marks all over the, the wall in head office, but now we do it on Visio, so it's all so much better. Um, so I'll just read through this. So, so what we did was that we just took an applicant who had started their tenancy with us um, and we, we mapped out their journey. So the resident has applied for housing benefits. We know that there's a five week delay in housing benefit getting to us. After about a week, no rental housing benefit has hit the account. So the housing officer sends a letter as per procedure. So we have a procedure on the system, you pinged a button and a letter would go out. After three weeks, no rental housing benefit has hit the system. So we send a second, a bit more scary letter as per procedure. And then the resident phones, really worried about the letters, told it's okay, ignore the letters. We have to send them out as per procedure. After four weeks, no rent, housing benefits hit the system. We send a third really scary letter as per procedure. In five weeks, housing benefit hits the system and we got to understand why engagement with that resident broke down. They were scared to speak to us. So, so this is just an example and seeing journeys map, mapped out step by step really helps teams, managers, leaders see the system from the customer view and to see the consequences of some of the actions in current design. When we looked at systems, we found things like rent, for, rent, uh, for example, we found, found things like rent statements were difficult to read or understand. Uh, that created lots of unwanted demands and that was just us finding it difficult. Letters were quite scary. We had targets that drove the wrong behavior. We didn't always provide good upfront information at the right time. And we didn't meet the person. Um, so, so we did create barriers right from the very beginning. We found loads more, but I've only got 20 minutes. So I can't, you know, but please, um, I'm happy for anybody to get in touch with me afterwards if you want to. In the rent system, we found that most people genuinely wanted to pay but many of them couldn't. Uh, we made lots of assumptions regarding won't payers rather than can't payers. 
And we went out into the work to find out why the rent wasn't being paid. Some were in debt, some were in multiple debt, council tax, some people had bailiffs knocking at the doors, um, and as a consequence, didn't open the door to anybody. I've worked with a lot of complex cases uh, over the, the last few years, uh, having a look at some people who were in high arrears or had lots of antisocial behaviour going on. And when I've got to meet the person, when we've got to meet the person and really find out what the problem to fix is, um, it is a real learn. Going into the work is where we've done all our learning. Okay, next slide, please. So as I say, uh, the cultural shift, what's changing? And Jenny's already referred to some of this, but uh, this is just sort of um, the, the very top level. There's lots more, but building rapport from the start rather than we're the enforcer, we're the landlord, you'll pay your rent, whatever. We've got to, to meet the person and understand what matters to them and show an interest in them. Having a good conversation and asking more tailored questions. When we started to look at tenancy sustainability, um, we had a look at what we typically do now. And one of the things we used to do was when we'd go out and meet an applicant, we'd have a form called a criteria form. And it asked questions like, uh, do you have any support needs? Uh, where did you live before? Just sort of basic, typical questions. So what we said was that to enable us to have a better conversation, let's do away with the form. And I remember that day in the room, there was horror in the room uh, because people were saying, oh, well, if we go out without a form, what if we are, forget to ask something? Uh, we, you know what? But actually what we found was that by asking certain questions, we got certain answers. Uh, so we didn't have a really good conversation with that person that was tailored to the person showing an interest. Where were they before? What's brought them here? And having those conversations truly did take practice. It does take practice. Again, starting and ending tenancies clean. And as Jenny referred to about, you know, what we try and do is get the incoming uh, res uh, applicant to meet the outgoing resident. So if there are carpets there or there are curtains there where before we used to pull them all out, they can agree between themselves what's going to be left and what's not going to be left. Getting in early problems arise, you know, identifying those triggers because prevention is key. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. And this, this is just an example of understanding the problem to fix. So we are learning as we go along, but this is somebody phoning up, and this is typically what, what did happen. This is taken from a real case. Understanding the problem to fix. So somebody phones up and they say, I can't pay all my rent this month, but I'll make it up next month. What we would have done is make a note on the system to say that this person has phoned up, um, they, they're gonna pay next month, they're having problems, and that would be it. But actually, if we could get in sooner and have a better conversation to understand, well, what is going on here? Is there a problem? If somebody can't pay, there is something going on. And this is one, one example of going in and speaking to a resident. Um, and, and she said to us, well, I keep losing my jobs and then I have to claim benefits and this mucks me up financially. So we, we questioned, well, why do you keep losing your jobs? What's going on? So my health isn't so good. I haven't been to the doctor. I don't think they can help. I get really low. So from that, we get that when they get low, they muck up their work and it's a vicious circle. So for this lady, the problem was to, to fix was to get to the doctor, to be supported, to get the right help that she needed. Um, and as a consequence for this lady, she actually uh, was uh, told that she wasn't well enough to work. She was severely under, underweight. She hadn't been to the doctor for years. She started to have lots of medical treatment, counselling and counselling for her son as well. So, so just getting in there and asking better questions helps us understand what is the problem to fix. 
Okay, so the next slide, please. The, by going into the work and the residents and meeting the residents and getting them to open up to us and talk to us, I felt quite privileged um, for some of the people who have been terrified of losing their homes, where they have opened the door to us and told us what they expect to us. And this is this is what we'd absolutely expect. But, but for them to tell us, so I've just put this together and these are very much the principles that we work by and uh, we're working on working too. So they say that they want to be listened to and understood. They don't want to be judged. They want to be treated with respect and dignity. They want to be treated with kindness. They want someone that they can trust and count on. And they want us to work at a pace that's right for them. Going into the work is where all the learning is and, and talking to the residents. So just next slide, please. Thank you. So these, this is the outcome star that they've mentioned at the beginning. Um, measures are really important. Um, they help us learn and understand performance. But what we found when we started looking at tenancy sustainability and helping people stay in their homes was that people measures weren't quite so simple. So we have here the outcome star, which is the circle. And this is a tool to help us understand what matters to somebody. And it's very much kept in the resident's own speak uh, because we didn't want to use categories because they may, you know, we may think it's a, a finance issue, but actually it's a health issue. So this is an individual measure. Um, it's a useful tool um, and the what matters will change over time. And we can do it in any way that we like. All of these outcome stars and the pyramid uh, are on our systems. Um, and I say that the what matters will change. So here, just for example, my family are important to me, being able to afford to do some of the things that I used to do, getting finances on track. I want something to focus on. Um, and I won't go through them all, but, but just having this can help us explore with the resident, well, what's stopping us getting there? You know, what, what are the barriers to, to stopping you do that? I remember doing this with a, a gentleman who um, uh, had real uh, serious issues with, with drugs. And it was when we were going out and doing some visits and I sat with him and just had a blank page. And I just did one of these with him um, just on a, a blank page. And he said to me, one of the things he said was that uh, he needed support to go to the job centre. And I said, so what's stopping you go to the job centre? What's happened? So he said, well, when I go to the job centre, they've treated me really badly and they've sanctioned me so many times because I know I muck up and I know I don't keep my appointments, but now they just... Uh, treat me really badly um, and and you know just getting underneath the barriers and what is stopping people get a better day have a better day so on the outcome star the zero is perfect and on the outside 10 is the worst and we'll score it with them sometimes we don't we'll just do it what they think but really the scoring isn't important it's more the direction of, of where the score, you know, where the, the outcome star goes. And the pyramid on the other side, um, I'm okay, I need help, I'm in chaos. This is our perspective of the resident. So some people come to us in chaos, some people fall into, I need help. And depending how we get them that help may depend where they go in, in the pyramid. Um, this pyramid can be used more easily from a data point of view um, because we can, we can measure changes uh, individually and collectively, but they are useful tools and they're both on, on our Dynamics internal systems. So next slide, please. Thank you. So this is something we've recently started to do because what I want to, and I, you won't be able to read all the writing, but it's just to give you a little, a bit of a flavor um, because what I wanted to see was that uh, we have a presenting problem, and in this case, it's rent arrears. 
So the blue line the graph is showing the rent, uh, rent arrears. This is a lady who was nearly £5,000, gone over £5,000 in arrears. And they said that the next step was notice seeking possession because she wasn't engaging, she wasn't opening the door to anybody. Um, so the blue line is the rent arrears, and that was going up. But if we just show that, we can see the pattern as well. And, and we wanted to be able to see the presenting problem, which is the transactional rent arrears, and the person on the same page. So all the red, all the writing above the arrears line is uh, the transactions that have been put on the tenancy notes. Um, all the red is non-engagement. So lots of that. Then we have the black line, and that shows where we tried getting in using a different approach. So this was um, a, a case that we sent a letter to this person and we said we, uh, we only sent a letter because she wouldn't answer the door, she wouldn't answer the phone. So we sent a letter saying we absolutely want to help you keep your home and we want to come and visit you. Now, the letter had no rent arrears on it. It, it had nothing to do with the rent, just about helping her and supporting her keep her home. And she did agree to meet us, which was just incredible. So after the black line there, it shows the arrears still going up because we had to get in quite quickly. We did an outcome star with her. She, she was a terrified lady, uh, lots of issues going on with her, bailiffs knocking on the door. Um, uh, but she did work with us and uh, we learned loads from her. And as you'll see, the arrears went up a little bit more whilst we were getting support in place. And then now the pink is all the direct debits that uh, she's managed to pay um, and, and she's well on plan. Um, and above that, we've got the outcome star. Um, so you'll see where it started. It was all on the outside and we've managed to sort of it in. They're not all as successful as this, I will say, uh, but this just shows an example of having a whole picture of the presenting problem and the person um, on the same page has really helped us. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, so eviction figures are now in the low single figures compared to 50 or 60 before we changed our approach. The main reasons for evictions have been uh, rent or ASB related. Um, abandoned properties are concerned and as Jenny said we're, we're working with um, shelter at the moment uh, to look at um, preventing uh, 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 homelessness. Uh, evictions into homelessness. Prevention is key and meeting the person, the relationship, starting tenancies clean, mm. getting in early at trigger points and understanding the problem to fix is key. As I said, for some moving away from traditional way of working has come easier um, than others and it takes time. Uh, this isn't a quick fix, this is a cultural shift over years. And it absolutely requires buy-in from the top, from the board, from the CEO, from directors. And we continue on our journey. Um, and every day is a learning day. Thank you. Thank you, Officer. Thanks, Sue. That was that was excellent. That very interesting indeed. I like this person-centred approach to looking at these issues and uh, and the systems thinking. Yes, but very interesting approach. Um, very helpful to have someone like you in the organisation. I would have thought mm -hmm. looking at the the way you approach things from a different dimension. Um, shall we? We'll move straight on to to um, Simon Young of of South Yorkshire Housing Association. I know they've done some great work on reducing evictions. Um, uh, Simon's the um, head of landlord services there and um, and um, the culture of South Yorkshire has, has really been something that they've been focusing on. Um, so we're gonna hear more about that as well. So I'll hand straight over to, to Simon. Thank you, David. Um, 
Vicky, I'm, I'm in the same position. I can't screen share, so okay. I um, could just um, share yeah. my presentation, please. Yeah, well, okay. To share screen. I'll um, I'll just bring it up. Um, so it will take a couple of seconds. So um, if you're able to just yeah, of course, do a couple of intros. So, and then yeah, I'll do that. Um, so um, you'll see a lot in my presentation that's very similar to what um, Jenny and Sue have gone through. Um, I didn't see their presentations before, so um, there's no, uh, we're not collaborated and made sure that um, we're just reinforcing the same messages, but you'll see some, some very similar stuff. Um, I will kind of emphasize the culture stuff and try and bring some of that stuff out. Um, I would say um, some of the, the interesting things I will, will cover in my presentation, but um, I would always encourage when, when we're talking about evictions, I would always encourage members of staff to attend evictions. And anybody who's attended an eviction would, um, I think, understand the impact of it. I did that fairly early in my kind of housing career and found it pretty traumatic, actually. Um, very difficult. Um, almost like invading somebody's privacy. It's a very personal thing. And I think, um, and I encourage that to be not just rent staff, every member of staff to do that. That's not something we've done in South Yorkshire yet something we may consider, but definitely is something. Once you've done it, you understand why you'd want to avoid getting in that situation with somebody. Um, it really feels like that. Um, so yeah, coming on to my presentation, um, culture shift and the need for a thinking driven approach. So I'll try and uh, look and emphasize that. If uh, you could just move on to the next slide, please, Vicky. So I'm just going to um, go through who we are. Um, as David alluded to earlier, lots of housing associations were founded out of the home. So Cathy, so Cathy Come Home, a documentary, We're No Different. Uh, and in the immortal words, I take that, never forget where you're coming from. So that's kind of a line through uh, a kind of my presentation and I think through the organisation. Um, we manage nearly 5,200 properties. That's a mixture of general needs and supported housing. Important that we've got supported housing. We get a kind of, it kind of does help our culture quite a lot. And we have got a lot of kind of uh, homeless interim accommodation schemes and other schemes, um, housing first schemes that colleagues manage. And that does give us a kind of really good understanding of the space. So that's important. And we were a founding member of Homes for Catholics. Uh, next slide, please. So our purpose is to, that customers can settle for home, live well and realise the potential. And obviously, when you live, you're in this space, you can see how that kind of purpose, um, eviction is kind of at the other end of that, really. That's um, working absolutely against that purpose. It doesn't allow people to settle. It obviously is a massive impact on them personally. It's a really bad um, individual outcome for them and a bad outcome for the organisation. And you can hardly say that somebody's experience with you is a joy if that's where you end up. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'll just go through some of the figures. Um, this is kind of where our evictions and abandonments have gone. Um, we're down in the kind of low levels now, kind of 11 the previous year. Um, We've got this includes abandonments and, and we do include abandonments because it's a kind of failed tenancy. This is around, around sustaining tenancies, so abandonments are important. So that's why we've got a figure this year. Most people will, will uh, monitor an evictions won't see a figure there this year. We've got one because we have had some abandonments, uh, unfortunately, and, we've not, and that for us is a failure to succeed. Um, we've not succeeded in sustaining that tenancy, so it's an important start for us. But you can see the kind of pattern uh, of eviction and abandonments um, that we've gone through and the kind of journey. So we started in the high 50s, really, not so long ago, and now we, we're much slower. Uh, next slide, please, Vicky. And that's not kind of come at the expense of uh, arrears performance. It's the contrary. Um, we've actually performed better um, on arrears while we've been going through this kind of journey, sustaining tenancies. 
Um, and I think it's an interesting fact um, and probably something the sector should look at um, during COVID is um, what has the impact really been financially on the sector of uh, not having evictions? And yes, some, some organisations might find a different pattern than areas have gone up, but what have they actually saved in other parts of the organisation? And you'll see in, the, in another part of my presentation, I'll look at and try to emphasise you've got to look at the whole system and the whole system costs the eviction. Uh, next slide, please. The other, other people, um, Jenny and Sue both talked to them about the importance of a top-down approach and interest. This is our board. They're really interested in, uh, in this area, as you can imagine. Um, John Sparks, who's the chief executive crisis, not on that picture, but um, he's a major driving force on this. And one of the biggest questions that our board and our exec team and Tony, our chief exec, not normally where are we on arrears, it's how many people are we evicted. That's almost the most important thing when we're talking about um, managing people's tenancies uh, for them, well, it is the most important thing. The other things kind of come secondary, um, but they've been really important. And I would say it's really important to have a, a top-down interest and a real genuine interest, and they've got that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I think it's again it's a thread that's come through um, some of the early presentations. Customers have got to have confidence uh, when you're con they're, they're contacting you, and I think that applies to the feel of the whole organisation. So it's not just when they're contacting you about rents and having a really great rents team. It's about the whole, having confidence about contacting you more generally. Um, I was struck a few years ago, I did a piece of work with Andy Buck, who was on our board. I just happened to be the chief exec of Sheffield CAVs. Uh, it was looking at the breathing space problem, and it was a meeting with a, a lot of kind of um, CAV advisors around debt problems. And they were, they were all em emphasising the importance of that first contact. And if somebody picks the phone up for the first time as a cry for help, and they don't get supported, they'll not ring again. You might be ringing them, but they won't ring you. So it really is important how, you, how that first contact's made. So this slide just kind of, this is just some feedback from my uh, um, customer, uh, customer survey we've just done recently, an independent survey, and some of the comments that our customers were making uh, about SYHA, which kind of fills you with kind of reassurance that we are getting this right. Not always, we'll not always get this right, but we're getting it right a lot of the time. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, again, people in early presentations have said, well, what a customer are asking for when they're contacting us when they've got a problem with rent or a SB tenancy sustainment problem. This came from a bit of customer, um, customer care uh, training we did with Mary Gover, but I think it applies well to this, uh, to this scenario. Um, what questions people are asking when, you, when they do contact you. So are you committed? Are you committed to that relationship? People will pick that up. They'll pick you up in your language. They'll pick you up in the way, way you're talking to them. Can I trust you? And do you care? For me, there are three really important things that you need to, we, we need to be asking when customers are contacting us and getting that right will we'll go a long way in terms of culture. To, um, moving people uh, along this journey. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, again, other people have talked about it, the importance of empathy, and I'll put this slide on because um, this was a kind of Yammer post um, that significantly for me came from our rent management team. They're the ones who manage the food bank collection in SYHA both physical food bank collection and financial food bank collection. Um, so it shows that they're dealing with people in, in financial difficulties. Well, that's, my, that's their everyday existence, that they, they understand the situation people are in, the empathy they've got, how they can kind of provide support to those people. So empathy is important and uh, you can't overemphasize that. Uh, next slide, please. And kind of going next to mile, I kind of this this these are just a couple of excerpts from um, team posts 
uh, like everybody else in this pandemic, um, everybody's been on teams. Uh, we're living our lives on teams, aren't we? And I'm actually in our, a number of my teams, uh, kind of um, teams first. And you can learn a lot, I think, in terms of culture from doing that, looking at what people are saying and doing online um, when they're talking to their colleagues. And I just picked up a couple of these just before Christmas. And I've seen loads of them over the course of the kind of pandemic about how we're trying to help and support people, you know, people sharing about how they've, how they've had, what, what they've accessed to help support a particular customer. But these, these kind of stuck out for me because they weren't really anything massively to do with helping people pay their end. They were more about helping people get through the daily life or making it a bit more of a joy. So getting somebody a Christmas present at Christmas was one of their customers or... Um, there's a, there was a, they got a network where they could um, get somebody a meat box or something like that. And it just struck me that that kind of made me feel a bit more reassured about the culture that we were working in uh, and going that extra mile. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I suppose one and one of the things we've kind of tried to be emphasising, um, not sticking rigidly to. Policy and procedure, we've got a policy and procedure, everybody's got one of those, uh, no doubt, uh, came out in, in both uh, presentations, Jenny's and Sue's, it's not really about sticking to that, it's about doing the right thing and understanding and having a relationship with your, your customers, and I do overhear a lot of our kind of conversations that we're, you know, my team have with customers, um, they get to know them really pretty well, you know, some so quite often, quite a lot of depth about their personal circumstances. I, uh, I overheard one of our rents team recently talking to a customer <laughs> and they knew that their sister was in hospital. They knew all, a lot more than you would have expected them to know necessarily dealing with their rent account about their personal circumstances. And we're discussing that as much as about what they could do to help them uh, about rent payments. So I thought that again, that was, really important that this is just around making sure your team know those people, know what the right thing is for that particular individual customer and don't blindly follow, as I think Sue was alluding to, a set procedure that that's letting us out at that point, that's at that point, et cetera, et cetera. And we might not have got this 100% right now, but we've really been working towards that, that not necessarily being the case, empowering people and giving them the discretion to actually do what's the right thing and what's going to be that person. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, again, uh, Jenny mentioned in early presentation about partnerships. They're obviously massively important, the local authority partnerships that we've got, uh, partnerships with other agencies, partnerships within, the, within your own organisation around people who can provide support. We've got a big uh, employment arm. That, uh, if we've got people who need to get into work, we, we know we can refer into the Digi Friends um, initiative at the moment, where getting people online and all sorts of stuff like that. So that's all important. I just took these in because they have particular relevance to kind of our rent arrears management work. So we've partnered with Big Issue, Big Issue Invest to, to improve people's credit ratings, uh, utility renewals, so we get people on the best energy um, tariffs when they move into the new tenancies. Um, step change, and obviously we, we're dealing with lots of people who are trying to manage debt and getting really good quality advice. We did that for uh, entitled to because we do, do we do do an affordability check at the start, of this, but it's not about excluding people. It's about understanding what are their financial circumstances uh, moving into a tenancy, and so we, we're going into it open-eyed, and they are as well because we can emphasise some of the kind of costs associated with moving into a new tenancy, what people need to be thinking about, what support they can get. Um, tomorrow we've got a, a team meeting, we've got Yorkshire Water coming along, they're going to talk to us about if somebody's in water debt, what support can, they, we, can we offer our customers and, and referring to them. So that's important. Citizen advice, we've got a really good relationship with our citizen advice. You know, we know the kind of advisors there and who we can kind of uh, refer people in some to get some really solid advice and we we do fund some specialist debt advice in Sheffield if we've got if people in um, severe people in severe debt. Uh, next slide please. Um, 
touched on it. It was touched on earlier, but we we've developed a furnished offer in the last two years. That was largely out of experience from our letting team, uh, our management team around the difficulties people had moving into tenancies who've got nothing, um, who never maybe had a tenancy before, or the circumstances have changed, the relationship breakdown, all sorts. So we've developed this and it's been really popular. We're kind of cranking up even more now. It does include floor, floor coverings. That was one of the things um, we provide floor coverings in bathrooms and kitchens, but we don't provide them in the rest of the properties. But you know, we will provide it on furnished, covered by housing benefits. So it's uh, you know it's service chargeable. So housing benefit will pay this as will universal credit. And it's been a big real uh, assistance to people that have um, come to us via the homeless route, maybe street homeless. Um, we've managed to house people directly from street homelessness during the pandemic. And it's been, uh, most of those have had uh, a furnished package with us. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to emphasize this, this last slide. Others may have seen this before, but this is the kind of piece of work we're looking at, like kind of what are, what are the cost of evictions then? And, and this was, I did probably a couple of years ago now, maybe 18 months ago now. You can see an eviction, if you map in all the clearance costs, void repair costs, legal costs, and they're going up as many people will know. You, you can see a, an eviction is also a very costly thing for a business and something to avoid. So low evictions are good business. Um, they really, uh, as well as a really good outcome for our customers for individuals and for the system you know that the the, the low evictions are a really good thing um, next slide please and this kind of looks at well if we've not gone down the route of reducing evictions and abandonments well what might our costs still be and what are they now so you can see that we we may be saving about hundred thousand pounds a year by going to a different approach so it's good business um, particularly if you look at it in a holistic sense. I know lots of organisations have got rents teams and neighbourhoods teams and letting teams, and they're all, they're all approaching it maybe from their own PI. It's important to look across the whole system and say, well, what's happening across the whole system and how does that benefit or not benefit the organisation and the customers that we're here to serve? Um, and that's the end of my presentation. I'm not saying that SWH have got everything right. We definitely haven't. We're on a journey like everybody else has described. Um, we're working hard to improve what we're doing. Um, culture, of hopefully I've emphasised, is really important. Um, uh, I'll, I'll obviously share my contact details if anybody wants any more detail that I've not uh, been able to share. Um, and um, I've no doubt people could easily replicate that if they have got the will and the um, senior support to do it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Simon. It's always great to hear from South Yorkshire, all the stuff they're doing, great stuff they're doing on, on homelessness and supporting homeless people. And uh, Simon's just sort of taken us through their approach to evictions, which really has yielded results. and. Uh, Fascinating to see the, the graphs of the evictions abandonments coming down and the savings in, in, in costs. But also, you know, ultimately, you know, the, the, as you mentioned at the very beginning, the, the huge human cost of, of, of an eviction uh, um, into homelessness. So now we've got some time for some questions. Um, I thought a <laughs> fantastic presentation. So um, it'd be great to sort of pick up some of these things. So, um, where can we start? I've got to try and pull this all together. Um, someone's, someone's asked about, can we see the presentations? I think we can put those up on the, on the Homes for Cathy website, Vicky, probably, can't we? Um, at the end of this meeting. So, yes, you can get to see the presentations again. Yeah, that, yeah. that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll make them available on the website. Thanks, thanks. So... Ah, oh, Charlotte uh, Murray from South Yorkshire has got a question for Jenny. Um, how did Shelter get the housing minister to really care about uh, what we're doing and, and make the changes? And, and does it involve the regulator? 
Well, um, it doesn't involve the regulator, actually. Um, the regulator is, um, is is much more about value for money and, and they, they haven't um, historically asked many questions around evictions or allocations, to be honest, and perhaps that'll change in future. Really, I think what worked for us with Julie James was it was partly timing. So um, Julie came in as a new minister and she wanted to make her mark. So John was able to talk to her and have a few meetings right in those early stages when she was looking for ideas to take on. Um, but what helped a lot as well, to be perfectly honest, is that Julie was raised in social housing. And so she came to this already feeling really passionately about the sector being the best it can possibly be. So we, it was that the door was ajar, frankly, and we just pushed it at the, at the right moment. Thank you. How, how does it work practically then if it's not if it's not enforced by the regulator? How how does it um how is it enforced is the wrong word, but you, do, you, do you know what I mean? Like how yes. have you, how is it been embedded? So it's been um it was linked to the rent settlement. So um I mean it's it's still a little bit vague about how that is enforced, isn't it? But um but they, they put a rent, a rent uh, settlement in place of CPI plus one, I believe it is. And, um, and in the rent letter was, we expect that in return for this, you will be eliminating um, evictions into homelessness. Um, but okay. I mean, uh, there's other things that can be done, I think, to help push it along. And it's something like uh, a stronger pre-action protocol, for example, would, would help things a lot. So there may be that we need to lobby for further um interventions in future or maybe for the regulator to take an interest we've got an election coming up in um two months in wales and and that might change things dramatically potentially as well which is a bit uncertain so basically if they don't if housing associations don't cooperate with um trying to reduce um evictions then they can't increase their rent by one percent yes cpi right. plus one yeah, yeah, yeah. that that's the uh, that's what's been said yes Okay, great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Very interesting because we're currently sort of campaigning as Home to Cathy to try to get the English regulator to look at housing associations' performance in in housing and supporting homeless people um, as part of their revised remit uh, following on from the Social Housing White Paper. So, because um, in Scotland the the regulator does look at homelessness as as one of the indicators of how housing associations are doing. So it'd be great to you know see the English regulator and the Welsh regulator picking up homelessness um, and seeing homeless people as as stakeholders as consumers you know, uh, as part of this consumer regulation. Um, it's important it isn't just tenants who are seen as consumers, but but also potential tenants and homeless people, we've got a responsibility to those. Um, yeah, so um, any, any other questions for our speakers? Um, anyone want to dive in? There's um, one in the chat box, actually. Um, oh, is that? From, well done. So Sonal, um, I mean, Smith, um, a question for Simon. Have you experienced any problems with having housing costs paid for furnished accommodation through the service charge? Also, are the carpets included in the service charge? Um, yeah, I'll settle first part first. Um, no, we haven't. Um, I don't know whether that's because we've got an excellent relationship with our housing benefit providers, uh, particularly in Sheffield and Rotherham, where most of our tenancies are. And they all they also operate their own furnished accommodation schemes as well in those local authorities. So um, I think it might be a bit rich if they were refusing to pay our service charges and paying their own. So um, yeah, we've not had any problems either from them or from the DWP under Universal Credit so far. I said touch wood, it may happen. Uh, and yes, the carpets are included. Yeah, um, we do include those in the service charge. It kind of works on a kind of package basis. So people build it up from a five, 10, 15 pound, 20 pound package uh, based on their choice of the kind of elements within the furnished package. The carpets are always a, an opportunity for people if they want that something they want to go, that they want, they really want to go down. Um, and, uh, and when we built the model uh, around this, it's kind of just, um, and was always a point from our board 
Um, we, we're just trying to cover any costs we've got um, as best we can. We don't want to make any money out of this. So as soon as we kind of cover the cost of the furniture, that's done things over for us if we can. And we'd obviously plan then at that point do some fancy footwork around uh, making that tenancy place not a, uh, not a furnished tenancy because it can sometimes become a bit of a poverty trap. I think furnished tenancies, particularly where it's reliant on coming from housing benefit or uh, universal credit housing costs. So we, 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 we're alive to that and how we're going to actually try and respond to that. But thank you for your uh, Thanks, Simon. Uh, we've got a question from Elsa. Elsa, I can see you. So do you want to ask your question? <laughs> you unmute and yeah. I was hoping to stay quiet and just sneak that one in. <laughs> um, it was just a question for Sue, really. Great presentation. Thank you, all, all three of you. Um, how did customers first find using the outcome wheel from the other side? I can imagine a culture change for staff, but there must have been a culture change for customers as well in asking those kind of really probing questions. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's the way um, it's done. So it is done quite informally. So what I've shown you on the screen is uh, where we have put the information onto Dynamics. So that's quite a formal looking one. When we've been out with residents, it is about having um, that conversation. So what uh, everybody does it differently. There's no, no prescriptive way. Um, and it depends who we're speaking to, but very often we'll have a conversation, especially if there's problems in that tenancy, with that tenancy, um, try and explore what the problem is. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll, so what many of us do is we'll just draw a circle and say, well, just let me make sure I've got all of this clear. And, and we'll put all of what they've said on a piece of paper. I draw a circle, lots of us do. And then by them seeing it visually, number one, number one, they know that we've listened to them and we've captured what they've said, but they often add things on. Uh, so, so we'll write down things and they'll say, oh yes. And, and, and so they'll add things on. I think the other part of that is that in the past, um, we have worked quite traditionally. So for some people who have been used to the traditional enforcement type actions that, you know, uh, we didn't meet the person. And uh, so for some, we've had to try and break those barriers down that, that we've created uh, through being more of an enforcer in the past. So, so, so yeah, so there's a bit of a mix really, um, but they've been quite happy to, because, we don't actually use the word outcome star much to them. It's more about let me just make sure that we know what matters to you, what, what are the barriers, what are the issues. Um, and, and I will say now, uh, since COVID, we've been doing a lot of that on the phone. Um, and for some, it's worked really sort of better, really, because they're in that place of safety and some of them will talk far more um, and will still do write down everything they say about the what matters and then go back over that. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of um, hit and miss. It's some of them are, we're having to break down barriers that we've created or have been created by other agencies as well. Thank you. Does that answer that? Yeah, yeah, I think that the idea of the kind of the chat about it rather than a form filling that that makes sense. I can see how you draw that out. That's really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sue. Um, got a question from Rebecca. Did you want to ask it, Rebecca Hutton? Yeah. Um, town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, just kind of following on from what you were talking about there, that does actually make sense. So, if, if you're if you're then just kind of creating it you're not actually setting up any boundaries at all. So if there isn't a prescribed form for it, then obviously the tenant is then kind of putting in the, the boundaries of really what's important to them. I'm guessing that um, the members of staff that are carrying that out, they would already have some ideas. So you might almost need to, to coax the tenant a little bit because they might not really be so forthcoming. But if you're just then sort of creating that just purely based on what the tenants telling you, then that makes sense. Um, once you've then gone through and completed that, is there anything you then put together afterwards? So almost like a, an action plan of, of what, they need, what they may need to do. So uh, it was referred to that 
perhaps somebody it might be the real problem of them going in and out of work is that they've got mental health that they need support with and um, with the GP once you've kind of had that that really like personal discussion just wondering sort of like how you follow that up because obviously people in that sort of dynamic they will have good days and bad days that might have been a day where they were really particularly engaging with you they might then spiral down for the next couple of weeks and potentially sort of almost forget some of the points of the discussion that you had. So do you then kind of follow that up just with something which is kind of quite informal, but just like a, a reminder of things that things that they need to do. So almost like that, that agreement of, you're not really taking that enforcement action because you, you've agreed they're gonna to go to their GP, they're, they're gonna do you know, X, Y, Z, they're gonna to engage to try and um, get their CV sorted if, if you've got like a tenancy sustainment officer within your organization and there are bits and pieces like that that you follow up with yeah and and we we um we have had to work over time about um exploring from the resident how do they see they can overcome the issues um be, because um over the years before we used to try and solve everything so um and and fix things um, but we've had to really try and work at the residents' own pace and get them to tell us what's stopping them go to the GP or what's stopping them, um, you know, get the support, the financial support that they need. Um, so, so we invariably get them to get to the answer um, because they will often know. And that's where having the good questions and practicing good questions. So, so it's very much about the building. I, I mean, it makes, you know, it's when I say it, I sort of think, well, it's obvious, isn't it? But I've even had to practice with my daughter, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it's about creating that rapport, that, that safety. Um, and uh, the right person to do that because not everybody is going to be the right person. So it could be that we use a different member of staff. Asking the right questions to get to the, the you know, sort of what is the problem to fix them. And perseverance again, and that's been mentioned before and Jenny mentioned it, it's, it's about keeping in there, don't lose and go, because we have lost a few of the residents that we had managed to get in, but because we didn't keep it up, um, and left it a few weeks, then in some cases we've lost it. So it's that keeping at it, keep plugging, move at their, their pace and getting them to tell us what the barriers are. Thanks, thanks very much. I had one sort of question myself really, was, was whether the, the models and the systems and the processes that you've sort of talked about, whether they're more difficult to implement if it's a pure case of antisocial behaviour as opposed to uh, a debt uh, rent arrears issue. I yeah. was one, perhaps all the, the speakers could answer that. Do you want to start, Sue? Yeah. Shall I? Yeah, OK. So, um, yeah, with antisocial behaviour, again, we're uh, practising the restorative practice and whatever. And, uh, and what we did find when we looked at antisocial behaviour was that the behaviour is a consequence of something. Um, so it's, it's a consequence of a problem. Um, so in old world, we would have gone in and said, well, look, that noise has to stop. But actually going in and understanding what, what is the problem to fix here? What, what is causing this behaviour? Um, so, so it's very much along the same lines as that, that rapport, asking good questions and finding out what is the problem to fix. Simon, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, we do very few evictions into antisocial behaviour, so none of the uh, stats, uh, were, I can't remember the last time we evicted somebody for antisocial behaviour. Um, I got a lot of neighbourhood staff who come from a supported housing uh, background. I think that helps us a bit, a fair bit, to be honest, uh, a fair bit, um, because it um, means that they've... they've um, come from that supporting area. Um, some of them have even got mental health training. We're finding that's a really big uh, and increasing facet of antisocial behaviour, people's mental health and mental health issues. So that's that's an element of it. And we also use injunctions a lot more. 
which are obviously, you know, they are a legal uh, remedy, but they don't involve somebody losing the home. And generally, they're very effective in ending antisocial behaviour when it gets to the really serious end of things. So they'd be the kind of thing. And Jenny, have you got anything on um, that I, subject? I think I would like, like Sue and Simon, emphasise the support um, role. Um, I've seen firsthand because we we used to have a an ASB preventative support project, um, and and so I've I've seen it for myself how um, that that holistic intensive support can work in practice. And once you get to know a family that is perpetrating ASB. You've, it can take some time to understand actually what their support needs are when people are, have got very complex um, situations that they're, that, they're, that they're trying to manage themselves. But the closer you get to people, the more you realise there are sinned against a sinning. You know, that was, a, that was one of the, the insights that were shared with me by the, the manager of that service at the time. And it, it's true, if, if, you, if you take that time to get to understand where people are coming from, you can address the root causes and you can you by having that that holistic support you can then bring in the other services that that household needs and so, yes maybe sometimes people do have to move for a fresh start but you don't have to just move it on and then move it on and move it on and move it on it can be addressed through through those kinds of service well thank you very much thank you um it's now 12 30 so um i don't think we've got any more questions in the box the chat box so uh, I'll, I'll wind up perhaps um, before I thank the speakers I should thank Vicky McDonald who I should have mentioned earlier on who's been organizing this whole whole workshop and uh, does great work for Homes of Cathy as well as her job as being social impact coordinator for Hightown so thanks very much Vicky for doing all the hard work um, for today I thought it's been a really helpful and informative session and the speakers have been brilliant uh learned a hell of a lot and, and i've been in housing a long while myself as you could probably realize so thank you to jenny simon and sue for those great presentations and uh, to everyone else i hope you found it useful and uh keep watching the homes for kathy website and and your email box and we'll be doing some more workshops uh, coming up and if you're not a member of homes for kathy or your association isn't then please uh, have a look at us and see if you could join because it's a, it's a movement we're keen to uh, expand and, and develop. Um, so thanks very much everyone and particularly to our, our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you.